call it remote, call it hybrid, call it whatever you want. How are you doing at leading at a distance? That's our topic today right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's free weekly e-newsletter, Unleashing Your Remarkable Potential, which is full of articles and resources to help you become a more confident and successful leader. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash newsletter. And now here's your host, Kevin. Today, we're talking about leading at a distance. You probably know that's one of my favorite topics and that I've been doing it for a decade. Uh, My guests today are also experts. Maybe I shouldn't say also. My guests today are experts in this area. I'm excited to introduce them to you and for us to share a conversation about leading successfully at a distance. Their names are Jim Citrin and Darlene DeRosa. Let me introduce them to you. Jim leads Spencer Stewart's North American CEO practice and is a core member of the firm's board practice. During his 25 years with the firm, he has worked with clients on more than 750 CEO, board director, and top management searches and success and secession assignments. In addition, he has served as a member of the board of directors for 20 years. Darlene DeRosa is a consultant in Stewart, Spencer Stewart's Stanford office and a core member of the healthcare and leadership advisory services practices. She brings more than 15 years of consulting experience with deep experience and expertise in talent management, executive assessment, virtual teams, and leadership development. She works with leading companies to facilitate selection, secession management, and leadership development initiatives. She's a trusted advisor to CEOs, CHROs, and boards. And together, this is why they're here, they've written a brand new book titled Leading at a Distance, Practical Lessons for Virtual Success, I am glad to have both of you here, Jim and Darlene. Thanks for being here. Our pleasure. Great to be here, Kevin. Uh, This got pushed back from when the book was launched uh, in May. We didn't, I had a conflict. So we're now having this conversation in the middle of July, but we know all three of us know that no one's going to really hear this for a while. Uh, But man, we're excited uh, to have you here. I'm really excited to have you both here. So let's start with uh, the fact that we have something in common, right? I wrote a book called uh, The Long Distance Leader, and you wrote a book called Leading at a Distance. And so uh, for that reason, I've been super excited for us to have this conversation. Um, tell me what led you to the book. Either one of you start. I'll let, I'll let the two of you decide about that as we go. But what led to the book? Dar- Darlene, um... Well, it really came from two sides. I'll start and then Darlene can pick up. So, Kevin, this is the eighth book that I've written and published, all on leadership and CEO search and succession. And last uh, last January in 2020, Spencer Stewart uh, fortunately was able to recruit Darlene from her uh, advisory firm that she led and she had a very specific area of expertise on virtual teams and virtual leadership. She has her PhD in the topic and is truly the world's foremost expert on leading at a distance. And when we met in January, 2020, she was telling me about her practice area and it was interesting, but it wasn't the centerpiece of life like it was going to quickly become in March. And when the whole world went remote, Darlene became the go-to expert for our clients, but also internally at Spencer Stewart. And she helped advise us on how we could advise our clients how to keep their businesses operating. And whether it was doing CEO searches like eBay or Virgin Galactic all virtually last um, spring and summer. Yep. And then uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, Darlene's publisher from her earlier book on virtual teams approached her at John Wiley and said, now's the moment. Uh, The world absolutely needs to know what you know. And she approached me and together we went crazy from 
July, August of 2020 until the end of the year and leading to the, to the launch in May of 2021. But Darlene, please build on that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great um, springboard, but I would add that it, it's been a really fun journey. And so as Jim said, I wrote my first book on this topic, almost as Jim jokes, way too early in 2011. And this book was really fun because we had such buy-in from executives. You know, we interviewed about 100 CHROs and CEOs for the book. We did three global surveys. So for, for Jim and I, it was sort of updating what we thought we already knew and looking ahead at how would leadership really change as we think about leading remote teams and leading virtually. So this book really was a passion that I've been really excited about. And Jim has actually really been a great partner because I think it combines a lot of topics that we're both passionate about leadership. For me, business and teams and how do you really leverage technology to engage with and collaborate with others. So it's been a fantastic journey. Perfect. And so, Kevin, you know this from, from your book, this topic is something that every person pretty much in, in the world has a perspective on CEO or teacher or healthcare worker or parent or kid. Uh, and unlike the other books where it's really always a work in process, how can you engage the right people? We had a 100% response rate from the world's top CEOs, the CEOs of Microsoft, UPS, Nike, across the board, Starbucks. They were like, yes, they want to talk to us about what they were experiencing and their CHROs. And they also wanted to know what we were learning from everyone else. So we became the book process became this kind of learning lab, not only for ourselves, but for all these companies. And it was so much fun. Truth be told, they took the calls because they wanted to know what you were learning from everybody else. Uh <laughs> Absolutely. And we, we used the interviews also to spread our knowledge. And it was this really virtuous cycle. And now we're doing all this client consulting where we have programs based on this, on what to do when companies are coming to us to say, okay, here's what's working, here's what's not working, here are our issues. So it's really, really interesting. Absolutely. So, you know, I think we would all agree. I mean, I haven't tested this comment with you both, but I think we would all agree that leadership is leadership and so much about what we need to do as a leader hasn't really changed. And yet um, there are some things that are perhaps more important than ever. So Darlene, from your perspective, uh, when we're leading virtually, when we're leading at a distance, whatever word you want to use there, when we're not seeing our folks every day, uh, what are the leadership skills that, that become more important now than ever when we're in that situation or as yeah. maybe as we're in that situation? Yeah, it's a great question. Interestingly, in our first book, we did a lot of research about what differentiates best in class virtual leaders. And Jim and I talk about this all the time. We, even back in 2011, came up with the RAMP model, which really encapsulates what great virtual leaders do. And that's everything from building trust and relationships to holding people accountable, to motivating and influencing people, and then creating enough process and structure to drive team performance. Interestingly, in the research that we did for this book, the RAMP model still held up. So I think that's what's really at its essence has not changed to your point. But what Jim and I have certainly noticed, again, during the global pandemic and economic crisis, leaders really stepping up and leading with greater authenticity and vulnerability and empathy in ways that I have never seen. And I think that's fundamentally going to change the profile of what our clients are going to be looking for as they think about the leaders of the future. So from my perspective, you know, it, it is it is about what good leadership is, but doing it virtually, as you know, is more challenging and there's just a different dynamic. And so I think it has raised the bar on what leadership is going to look like in the future. You know, it's interesting that you said the word empathy because back when, when, while you were writing the book, um, I, I wrote quite a bit about the fact that we're living in the age of empathy. And, and a lot of leaders figured out, oh, I need to be more empathetic. And I'm really hopeful now that we're now that, you know, we're past the peak. I'll just leave it at that. We don't know really what the future holds, but we're past the peak of the pandemic anyway, that people will remember that. Right. And not lose that muscle that they strengthened, uh, if you will. So you have anything you would add to that? What's what's even more important than ever question? Well, well, let me illustrate this by a study we did. We So at Spencer Stewart, we work with boards to identify and recruit CEOs and top leaders. 
we took a look at the CEO specs, the position specifications from 10 years ago and from this last year. And we looked at what was very different and something accelerated to Darlene's point. What accelerated in the last year was the importance of purpose led leadership and empathy and, and transparency and authenticity. But purpose is something that everybody really wants to be a part of and, and buy into a, an organization or set of activities that they really believe in. But that went from kind of a nice to have to the central aspect. And the reason why that's so important is in a virtual world, people are, their discretionary effort is what determines whether they and their organizations really thrive or just kind of go along. And without the combination of tapping into a deeper purpose and leading in a style that, hey, we're all in it together, being real, being empathetic, being a human and being honest and transparent, that's what leads leaders, allows leaders to tap into that discretionary effort where people are working remotely. So the purpose plus that authenticity and transparency has absolutely accelerated over the last year what had been a slow build from 10 years ago. But my follow-up question is this, um, about purpose, because I think that's such an important piece of this, right? Um, how do, what do we need to do differently as a leader to lead with purpose and to inspire our teams when we're at a distance? Yeah, and, and one thing I can start with, Jim, and then feel free to, to add, is that you've got to work harder. As Jim said, it takes more, um, you have to be more deliberate when you're working virtually and more thoughtful about how and when you engage with your team. And so clearly, you've got to really invest in getting to know the people on your team, to know what motivates and drives them differentially, and then use a lot of style flexibility to really lead and engage people based on their unique sense of purpose. So it's an investment. You've got to ask really good coaching questions. You've got to understand what motivates people and use that to tell stories and, again, adapt your style based on their specific needs and what, what's important to them, what values they have in particular. So that, to me, is, is one of the fundamental things that we've seen great leaders do. And really good examples at a pharma company right now, I'm coaching the chief commercial officer, and, and in his town hall, he used awesome stories based on doing some, some data and getting some survey data on what motivates the team in the commercial function and then using stories and feeding that back to people as a way to say, I heard you and we're going to leverage this to motivate the commercial organization. Really transformative and quite great. So that connects, uh, just a second, Jim, that connects to our point about being empathetic, right? Exactly. Like if we're doing a good job of really knowing where our folks are, we may be hearing those stories. We're certainly going to have a much better chance of knowing uh, what we need, what's going to connect better for them. Absolutely. Yep. There, there are two other ways, and I, I will share an extremely powerful but unbelievably simple tactic for how your audience, Kevin, can, can operate with purpose and lead with purpose starting today. That is to start every meeting or every introduction that you make with what is the intrinsic motivator. Let me be clear. When people meet someone, they say, hi. Uh, most people say, hi, I'm Jim Citrin. I've been at Spencer Stewart 25 years. I lead our CEO practice. I'm based in Stanford, Connecticut. Great to meet you. That's the way most people do it. That's very extrinsic. But there's another way to introduce yourself and to start meetings, to say, Kevin, I am so excited to be a part of this conversation for two reasons. I get my energy by learning and sharing knowledge and, I, and building relationships with leaders around the world. For that reason, in my years of leading our CEO practice, et cetera. Uh, studies show that when people introduce themselves with that intrinsic motivation, the person on the other side of that has all these attributes of, I would follow them, I would trust them, I want to work with them, I would like to do business with them dramatically higher. It's the same thing when a manager or a senior leader starts a staff meeting or a town hall to say, here's why we're, why we're here today. We're in the purpose at Spencer Stewart of discovering and developing leaders for a better future. And so that is something everybody can do immediately lead with purpose and what's the intrinsic motivator 
and when you start meetings and when you introduce yourself. Anchoring that at the beginning, um, super powerful, not just for that, the individual introduction, as you said, Jim, but for that, the way we start our meetings. And, and I know you, you all have a chapter in the book about virtual meetings. I don't know if we'll get there specifically or not, uh, but uh, there's no doubt that there's value there. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier, Darlene, when we were talking about uh, sort of what's different and what do we really need to do when we're leading at a distance, you, you mentioned the T word, the five letter T word, trust. So what is, what are some, both of you, give me some tactical advice that you have learned and that you use to build trust at a distance. Yeah. Well, one thing that, that we recommend to leaders is it takes more time in a virtual setting, as you probably know, Kevin, to build trust because you don't have, you know, the background, the context of an individual. And sometimes you've never met the person face to face. So it takes longer to build trust. So in, in a ton of research that's out there, what we know is really important to quickly build trust virtually is to establish what's called swift trust, which is, do I trust you? Do I find you credible? And are you reliable? So that's really important. And leaders need to spend time making sure team members on a virtual team, for example, know one another, they're familiar with their backgrounds because that fosters that swift trust. But then obviously, you know, it's very important to also just have coffee chats with people virtually, engage in that ad hoc type of, of um, dialogue that you would if you were to run into someone at, in, in the lunchroom in the building. So you've got to, again, be more thoughtful about it. One virtual leader that we work with uses um, some technology to, to randomly rotate people on the team for just virtual lunches. So it's the little things like that that are pretty easy to replicate. But again, it comes down to being a bit more deliberate and thoughtful. Absolutely. Jim, you want to add something to that? Just, just that uh, when, it said, when, when Darlene says it takes longer, it, it, it takes longer in elapsed time. But you can break those trust building, relationship building uh, engagements into really snippets, a 10 minute check-in, a, a Zoom call or a video call, or even a phone call while you're walking. It might take a month of five, 10 minute chats to replicate what in person might be a two hour dinner. But being intentional, as Darlene says, is the key. And the check-ins, and, and again, it's a very powerful technique, uh, especially for senior executives and senior leaders to be able to use the technology and go direct further down the organization because the 15 minute chat that a CEO has with a manager in a different location and just checking in, how's it going, Kevin? Tell me how your kids are and what's going on with your, with your parents or whatever it is, that actually does a huge thing to building trust. A, a sense of connectedness. So I love Jim that you said, you know, I, I, I don't know how old you are, but I know that you're older than Darlene and you're closer to my age than Darlene's age. And I, I just have to say, Darn. I appreciate that you use that word phone because this device thing can actually be used to call somebody. I, I have to remind my wife, my mother and my daughter of that sometimes because so I'm not, I'm not discriminating against any generation. So Jim, do you want to take a, a shot? What do we need to remember or do differently when we're doing selections, doing hiring virtually? Well, some of the things are absolutely the same. And here's something that people need to understand on both sides of the hiring uh, di discussion. People often make their decisions very, very quickly. And Malcolm Gladwell, wrote about this and and we've you know written you know we've all read you know fast and slow and all that daniel kahneman but uh, one of the things if you're a, a hiring leader especially virtually you have some advantages there's some real advantages to interviewing virtually um and there's some pitfalls to avoid but then if you're a candidate there's some insights that you can use to advance your chances. So I'll go on both very quickly. Perfect. When you're interviewing virtually, you can take advantage of the setting to say, oh, Jim, I see a map of the United Kingdom on the back wall. Tell me why about that? And if we were meeting over at an office, that might not come up. Uh, and you can say, oh, Kevin, go to your bookshelf and pull out one or two books that are really impactful, or tell me about that picture. So that's a way to use the technology to get deeper insight and build the relationship with, with the person. But 
they, what I was going to say about the way decisions are often made in the first five minutes of interviews. And uh, most people are unconscious about this. And there's been a ton of academic research that in the first five minutes, which goes back to what we said earlier on the, the introduction, even an interview is so important yep. because in the first five minutes, interviewers typically will say, oh, I want to, I like Kevin, I want to hire him. And then they spend the rest of the 25 minutes in the first 30, 40 minute interview looking for data to support the decision that they've unconsciously already made. Yep. So the advice to the hiring leader is guard against that. Be open-minded, keep getting data and not making decisions prematurely. However, if you're the individual and you're the candidate, it's really important to know that your first three or four minutes, how you say hello, and it's more important virtually to create energy right from the start because you don't have the power of a firm handshake and all that. Right. There are huge advantages to interviewing virtually from logistics, getting people into a process quickly, but also much more importantly and strategically is to open the candidate pool, both geographically and to underrepresented minorities that you might not have the access to if you're just doing everything physically. So we see some huge advantages to that. I agree with all of that. And your point about using the using the cues you get from their physical environment, I think is super important. And one of the many reasons why I don't really love all the backgrounds, that, the fake backgrounds that people use. But now I would have less, I had more cues for that with you, Jim, than I do with Darlene. Although I would probably want to know why that particular picture behind her. But Darlene, what would you add to Jim's comments about? about yeah, well, no, those are really good concrete, practical tips. And I think going back to what we said earlier, Kevin, about just the role of the leader has changed. I think we're seeing in our um succession practice at Spencer Stewart and a lot of the work that we do in leadership advisory, organizations who are hiring virtually doing additional testing and assessment to, to look a bit deeper because you can't obviously gather everything from a video interview or some of the, the presentations that people might do, but going a bit deeper, especially to get at some of those things that we talked about earlier around empathy and is this someone who can likely inspire from behind a screen, for example? So right. I think, you know, for, for us, we've definitely seen an increase in organizations using, to Jim's point, to avoid bias, a much more robust assessment process to get even more data to be confident that they're making an informed decision. Perfect. So I mentioned this at the start, that we're having this conversation in July of 2021 for anyone who might be listening far later. Um, but there's a word that's now in our dialogue in our dialogue. Far we, we knew the word as kids, perhaps, but now we say it all the time. That word is hybrid. Uh, and so I, I'd like for you to share your thoughts of each of you a little bit about, about the unique challenge. Because you, like me, picked a title that didn't say remote, didn't say virtual, really. It said leading at a distance or long distance leadership. So where we're focused on that word distance, people have got gotten used to fully remote. And I know that we're in agreement that um, hybrid is not the same as going back to where we were. Uh, and while can be awesome, um, isn't it isn't easier than either of the two we've already done. So what would you see uh, as the unique challenge or challenges, each of you maybe pick one around re remote work and hybrid, or excuse me, hybrid work and hybrid teams. Yeah, I, I can start, Jim, if you want. Um, I think clearly the biggest one, and this is getting a lot of attention, every CEO or CHRO roundtable that I do now is focused on this hybrid model and how do we create an environment that's inclusive and equitable that is almost like a left, an even playing field of sorts. So that if you're in a virtual meeting and you're the one or, you know, maybe there's one or two of you who are in your home office or in a Starbucks, how, how is that, how does that feel compared to people who might be around a conference table having sidebar conversations and sharing a meal? So, you know, there's ways obviously you can use technology to help bridge that gap, but organizations have been very focused on simple things like that. But this notion of equity and inclusion and frankly, making sure that leaders understand what does that mean for them as a leader? What are the things they need to attend to to make sure that they are treating people equitably? And a good example of this is we know from a lot of other research that sometimes out of sight is really out of mind. 
So how do we help our leaders avoid that and, and those unconscious biases that Jim talked about earlier? Because you know we do know from other research that this big challenge of the hybrid model is, for example, if I run into Jim in our Stanford office, I might say, hey, let's work on this project together and in, it perhaps even just unconsciously not go to someone else. So those are the kinds of things that happen when you happen to be in the same office as, as perhaps your boss or another colleague. Let, let me just take that, take that one step further. Uh, and this is the biggest challenge or risk to hybrid work. Darlene said it, it's equity and inclusion. Here's the fact, Kevin, research shows that whether you're a remote worker or an in the office worker, that does not determine the degree of your performance. In fact, in a global study, remote workers were slightly more higher performing, slightly more productive than in office workers. However, two thirds of managers around the world believe that if you're in the office, you're a higher performer. So well, I can see you, Jim. Exactly. So it gets worse. Who are the who are the populations that are more likely to be slower to come back to the office or more working remotely? It's working mothers. It's underrepresented minorities. And if the assumption of bosses is that if you're out of sight and you're out of mind and you're a higher perform a lower performer, then it's going to exacerbate the equity and inclusion risks and and problems of organizations and society. So managers need to be aware of their biases and as Darlene said, find ways to even the playing field and not assume that remote workers are not as high performing because that's going to make the what small progress has been made and equity and inclusion that needs to be accelerated. We don't we can't lose ground on that because people think that if they're out of sight out of sight, they're out of mind. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to add that just from all the roundtables that Jim and I have been doing, I think we've seen some really good examples of role modeling behavior, which I think is actually even more important in this hybrid model. This comes back to what we were saying, but one um, CEO that I was speaking to recently said, in September, we're gonna ask that people come back two days a week, that's the expectation. And then he went on to say, I'm gonna be in the office five days a week. And I sort of joked with him like, well, What's the unintended consequence that that might set? And so to me, as Jim said, that role modeling of behavior is actually even more important because you've got to be more cognizant of those unintended consequences. Yeah. And so to that CEO specifically, um, you know, I think people recognize that role is different. And so may maybe they're there three or four and not just two. But if they're there five, they are sending a message, right? Because people are watching and people yeah. know are knowing for sure. So I'm going to shift gears. Uh, we've got a little more time together. We could, I know that the three of us on camera or off could spend a lot of time chatting about all this stuff, but I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you both this question. I'm going to ask you first, Jim, are you ready? What do you yeah. do for fun? We're done talking about work. I want to know what you do for fun. Well, I do have a lot of fun with my work here. At well, I, know, I, I know, know, I know, I know. I know. I, Me it's too. true. That's but, not, but, a, that's not the question. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Uh, I love sports. Uh, I've run 21 marathons. I've got the London Marathon in October and the New York Marathon in November. I love tennis. I love golf and, and skiing. So I love sports and fitness. I've got three older kids. Uh, there are three kids with two of whom are engaged and I love hanging out with them. And I love uh, spending time uh, on the road in, uh, particularly in, in the UK where my life partner lives and we go back and forth. Uh, subject to quarantines, but uh, that's what I do for fun. And I, I read a lot too. All right, we'll get to that question in just a second. But Darlene, what do you do for fun? Yeah, so in my, my spare time, I spend most of my time with my kids, either at the lacrosse field, the football field, the basketball court, or cheerleading. So some combination of that. But personally, when I have free time, we love to bike ride and we go bike riding all the time. We love to travel. And one thing people might find surprising is that I have a deep passion for deep sea fishing. So no matter where I travel, I go fishing. We go fishing here all the time. I love to, to fish. Jim's even looking a little surprised. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah. So See? love, love to do that. Not on the golf course, Jim. 
<laughs> on the boat. That's what we need to do. Okay. So, um, so Jim, you mentioned it. So we'll go back to you first in terms okay. of reading. You already mentioned several books earlier that, you know, people probably might be familiar with, but what are you reading these days or, or what's something that you want to share with folks? So I, I, I have a, I have a reading pattern. I always read fiction before bed every, every night. I find it great and calming. I love historical fiction. And I always have a number of business books uh, going. So I, I read three or four books simultaneously, but I just finished a great book called The Evening and the Morning by Ken Follett. Uh, he wrote Pillars of the Earth, you know, global bestseller. This is the prequel to Pillars of the Earth set in the year 1000, and it was fantastic. From a business side, uh, I just finished Greg McEwen's new book called Effortless, which I love. Greg McEwen is a brilliant author. Uh, he wrote a worldwide blockbuster called Essentialism. And I love that. And I've done a podcast with Greg. I've had him on my LinkedIn stuff. And he's amazing. He's kind of like an Adam Grant. He's just this a higher, and Mal Malcolm Gladwell, like a higher order uh, of thinker. But this book, Effortless, is so powerful of how to do the most important or essential things in a way that is not so onerous and tedious. And I found that incredibly uh, motivating and, and helpful. And then finally, I uh, just finished uh, this amazing book called The Heart of Business by Hubert Jolie. Hubert is an old friend of mine. I recruited him to Best Buy in 2012, turned it around. He's an inspirational leader and he really believes that the role of business is a higher order. It's not just to deliver profits to shareholders. It's to serve all the stakeholders. And if you lead with heart and love and transparency and authenticity, as we talked about, you get the most out of people and people really find love in their work. So The Heart of Business by Hubert Jolie, Effortless by Greg McEwen, and The Evening in the Morning by Ken Fall. There we go. Beautiful. Darlene, what do you want to add to that? Reading yeah. list. Well, worst I, also thing. Started, I started the heart of business, which has been awesome so far because we got, we had the pleasure of hosting Hubert at a fireside chat. And one of the books that I'm just finishing is by a professor at Harvard that's called remote work revolution, because I was really interested in other points of view on remote work and Sadal Neely's done some really great work, especially related to the hybrid model. So I'm, I'm in the midst of that one as well. What I started to say was that it, one of the best and worst things about doing this podcast and for those of you who are listening, you know what I mean. And that is that you get all the stuff you want to read. So have at it, everybody. And oh, by the way, you want to make sure you're reading a copy of Leading at a Distance, Practical Lessons for Virtual Success. And uh, so quickly, tell us people can learn more about what you guys are up to. Where do you want to point people? Obviously, you can get the book anywhere books are sold. But where else do you want to point people in terms of your work or connecting with you all? Yeah, well, at, on our Spencer Stewart website, we have a whole page dedicated with a lot of really good practical resources around leading at a distance, um, blogs, and actually a new digital interactive piece that leaders can go to. And I think this is actually quite practical to get a sense of how they're doing against that ramp model that we talked about earlier. And it's, it's just a little interactive digital piece. So definitely check out the Spencer Stewart website. Beautiful. SpencerStewart.com, right? Yeah. All right. Um, Jim, I know earlier you had your Twitter handle up here. For, so and you, either you want to share any social with people real quick before we wrap up? I, I've got, uh, I'm a LinkedIn influencer. I've got 989,000 followers. So if 11,000 of your uh, audience, Kevin, want to just follow along, that would be a nice little uh, milestone on, on LinkedIn. And uh, but that's the place I really go to. Perfect. Awesome. So uh, before we go, everyone, and before I let these two wonderful people go, I've got a question for all of you. And if you've been with me before, you know the question I'm about to ask you. The question is, now what? What are you going to do with what you just heard for the last 34 minutes? What action will you take? Maybe it's something that you learned about the next time that you interview or are interviewed. Maybe it's thinking about those components of the ramp model. Maybe it's you thinking about your need to invest time differently to build trust with your team. Maybe it's thinking about how you introduce your meetings or introduce yourself. Whatever it might be, those just happen to be a few of the things that I wrote down. The challenge to you, though, is always 
not to just find this interesting, but to take action as a result. Hope that you'll do that. And I want to thank both of you, both Darlene and Jim, for being here. It was a pleasure to have you uh, here on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. And uh, to everyone else, you know, we're here every week. This episode was brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Uh, each month we release a new skill. Recently we released a skill, uh, the skill of building hybrid teams. So you can go to remarkablemasterclass.com to learn more about that or any of the other monthly released masterclasses. Hope you'll do that. And I hope you'll be back next week for another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>